We are joined again by Professor Mark Labar from Florida State University, and the title of his lecture is Better Living Through Civility. Professor Labar. Thanks, Jason. Uh, before I get rolling, well, actually, I want to thank you for once again uh, tuning in and taking the time to uh, see what we're doing uh, with these lectures and this lecture in particular. I want to build on some of the things I've talked about in previous lectures. Uh, we've talked about equality of authority that I said was going to be sort of the cornerstone of my last lectures, and you saw that in the lecture on rights. Um, and as part of the bundle of issues involved in both equal, sorry, both egalitarianism uh, and rights, we've talked about responsibility and accountability. And in my lecture today, I kind of want to uh, pull all those threads together uh, by way of sort of uh, making explicit, perhaps, what's just been implicit in, as a presentation of liberty. And I want to do that by advocating for a particular conception of civil society. So there's no, um, I don't think, generally agreed on particular meaning for civil society. Um, I am going to sort of give that notion particular content by building on some of the stuff that I've done um, previously and, uh, and making a case that that's a kind of society that we should really aspire to. So I actually want to um, begin with that notorious classical liberal Aristotle that's a joke. Aristotle was no classical liberal by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but he makes this notorious claim about human beings. Man is by nature a political animal. Uh, it's, uh, that's been a keynote idea for a lot of interpretations of Aristotle's ideas uh, with good reason. I want to explore for just a moment what he's thinking and what we should make of it. But Aristotle says he's thinking of when he says that, at least the first time in the politics, he says it's that we have speech. Uh, alone among the animals, we have speech, the gift of or capacity of speech. And that speech, he says, nature has endowed us with to enable us to live together. Other creatures live together, but what's unique to the way that we live together is that, he says, we participate together in talking about good and bad and right and wrong, which I think is actually quite a, a deep insight. So when Aristotle writes that, what he's thinking of is the Greek city-state, the polis. Uh, in Athens, of course, which is where Aristotle spent much of his life, but he was keenly aware of other Greek city-states at the same time. That was the sort of model for human social life that he had um, had in his mind when he said that. So uh, in Greece, in the 4th, 5th centuries BC, uh, if you did not want to live alone, and living alone was a really bad idea then, pretty much as it is now, uh, you lived in a polis. Those were really all your alternatives. Um, citizens and others in the polis, because there were lots of other citizens, was actually a very small subset of the population of the polis. They all lived together, he says, for mutual defense, enforcement of law, for trade, and for all the benefits of human social life with the idea of living well. Living well is really the aim of the kind of social life that he has in mind. So in Aristotle's mind, social life, that is living together with other people, with others of our kind, social life and political life are one and the same thing. Uh, but we know now that that was an accident of Aristotle's place, a place and time, and that they do not need to be the same thing. Uh, we have vibrant social lives uh, of many different kinds that are not themselves political, that transcend political boundaries, uh, we're actually engaged in one right now, the uh, engagement through this IHO seminar that knows no political bounds. Uh, and it's a social connection. It's us talking with each other. Mostly me talking to you, but I'll get some questions back, I hope, at the end. Uh, so I want to call a social formation of this sort a civil society. That is just a connection between people, uh, especially those in which uh, language and ideas are shared, but not necessarily uh, those. And I want to distinguish a uh, civil society from what I'm going to call a political society. That would actually be the other side of the distinction that Aristotle thinks isn't to be distinguished from social life. And I want to try to sharpen that up a little bit. So start with the idea of political society. So what's a society? Well, a society is, simple, at least the way that I'm using it here, 
is simply a group of people who are interacting with one another in any of a jillion possible ways. A political society is a group of people who are interacting on the basis of a monopoly in author of authority in law and coercive mechanisms of enforcement across some particular territory. And those of you who are familiar with the Weberian notion of the state will notice that I'm now tying the notion of political society or grounding the notion of political society to the idea of state governance. Again, in Aristotle's time, that was the polis. In our time, uh, the polis is long gone. What we now have are nation states uh, and perhaps um, uh, smaller political entities. But nonetheless, the, the basic model of the state uh, is what characterizes the governance of a political society. So you and I are members of political societies in virtue of citizenship by being uh, citizens of our nations or states or cities, or what have you, each of those represents a political society. The civil, civil society, on the other hand, is a group of people interacting on any basis that doesn't depend on that kind of claim to authority. Again, a, a claim to monopoly of authority um, within a given territory. So the notion of the civil, civil society is very liberal, it's very broad. Uh, even better, uh, a civil society can be a society consisting of other societies or consisting of the associations uh, of people interacting on such non-authoritative bases. So all of us are members actually of multiple civil societies. Um, by virtue of being a participant in this seminar, you're a member of one society. If you're a student, by being a student in your school, you're a member of another. Well, we're all members of families. Those are little civil societies. Twitter community is a civil society or maybe multiple civil societies, member of a church. Uh, clearly this list could go on and on and be extended indefinitely. These are typically voluntary. Okay, now I put an asterisk by voluntary. Uh, why did I do that? Well, the civil society known as the family, uh, we don't really have so much say over, at least when we join it. Right? We don't have any kind of choice about the families that we're born into. So at least at birth, um, the family is an involuntary civil society. I think though, as time goes on, that becomes less and less true. Uh, by the time we reach adulthood, we're making choices about the degrees to which we want to maintain that membership. And some of us feel uh, that our families are especially important and we find various ways to bind ourselves even more tightly into our, our family society. Others find a family society is not, not worth uh, staying with or perhaps even avoiding. Um, either way, we start transforming that original involuntary choice into a voluntary choice. So I think that asterisk is there, but that asterisk kind of goes away over time. Uh, civil societies are pretty much voluntary. And what's more is the family, again, I think makes quite uh, vivid these civil societies shape who we are, right? Our, our families are one of the most formative kinds of associations that we have with other people uh, in terms of making us who we are and friendships and lots of other things do that as well. Um, but especially when we choose our ways into civil societies, uh, that's a form of identification. It's also a way in which I mean, we shape those societies, but they shape us. So political societies and civil societies overlap. They, they come and go across each other's boundaries, but they differ in some, more, some important ways. The bonds of political society generally are based on claims, as I said, to monopoly, that is non-reciprocal and unequal authority, and are compulsory, while the bonds of civil society are not. That's one difference. A second one is that the bonds of political society end at legal and political borders, while the bonds of civil society do not. I don't know exactly who's watching uh, this video or participating in this seminar today, but I'm guessing that a whole lot of them are uh, beyond the bounds of the United, United States and the United States government, and they are participating in this through the virtues of technology, uh, despite the fact that they lie on the other side of a political boundary. So that's a perfectly uh, familiar kind of thing. Political societies generally exclude membership in other political societies, while civil societies do not. This one gets a more robust asterisk because of course in the US we have a federal system where I'm simultaneously a citizen of the uh, United States, I'm a citizen of Florida, I'm a citizen of Tallahassee, Florida, 
and so on. Those are overlapping jurisdictions, and there's complex stories about that. Also, uh, although some uh, national or political societies uh, require that if you join them, you give up membership in other civil societies, uh, others don't. Others allow for uh, dual citizenship. I believe we do here, at least in some circumstances in the US. I'm not one. But in general, um, political societies uh, exert, they, they really want to exert uh, a sort of exclusive uh, control over their members. And if you're a US citizen, you will find it that, for example, the IRS, Internal Revenue Service that's responsible for collecting taxes, takes that authority very, very seriously. The crucial claim here for the difference is that civil orders can emerge spontaneously, while political orders do not. For those of you that are familiar with Hayek's work, that distinction uh, might be familiar. Uh, even it's, if it's familiar, well, I want to walk back through it for those for whom it's not familiar, but I want to do something a little bit different with it uh, than usually is done uh, with Hayek's work. So uh, I want to claim now that civil societies represent spontaneous orders. So what are spontaneous orders? I should say, I should say they don't represent spontaneous orders. They are spontaneous orders. So an order is just a pattern that we can detect, re, uh, respond to, as Hayek says, we can project what's likely to be the case in uh, an unseen part of the pattern on the basis of uh, what's going on in the uh, seen part of the pattern. Uh, and orders or patterns originate in two ways. So the first, and here, I'm, here I am just following Hayek's lead, uh, a made order or taxes to use the Greek term that Hayek deploys is an order that's uh, established intentionally by the work of some mind or minds. So in America, high schools and universities, we have marching bands and people march around the field playing instruments. It's really interesting patterns. Those are great examples of spontaneous orders. Another that I became acquainted with uh, that apparently a lot of Europeans know about, but no Americans know about, is a phenomenon known as the Spartakiad. Uh, and uh, usually when I'm doing this live, I like to uh, bring up uh, a uh, YouTube video of a Spartakiad that I believe was uh, filmed in uh, Prague in 1985. I think uh, Jason and the IHS folks are going to put up the link here, which for copyright reasons, they are reluctant to have me launch into. I highly recommend that you do it. In fact, I'll pause for a few seconds here if you want to launch it. Maybe skip in like 30 seconds or so. It is quite spectacular. Uh, I'll keep talking. I'm not going to say anything that isn't about the Spartak Hyad. So go ahead and, and launch it and check this thing out. Uh, the, this one is filmed in this gargantuan stadium in uh, Prague. It's still standing. Uh, it's just absolutely massive. I mean, it dwarfs the biggest sports stadiums that we have here in the U.S. I think it sat something like a quarter of a million people. Um, and as you'll see, if you launch on it, there's something on the order of 100,000 uh, people participating in the Spartakiad. It's the giant, the legions of young men in diapers racing out. Uh, they aren't diapers. They kind of look like I can't help but think about diapers when I watch them. And they... Uh, go through this incredible demonstration of athleticism, uh, all order. So I think if you want a really nice um, example of a made order, tough to beat the Spartakia because those people are doing what they're doing precisely because someone or one sat down, came up with a plan and said, here's what each person is going to do at this time in this way and produce this pattern. That is, um, it's kind of funny, but it's actually a beautiful thing to watch. So that's the Spartakia. As I say, uh, people, especially that used to live in the communist bloc, they all know what the Spartakia was because I think the Soviet Union initiated and ran these uh, over sp uh, sporadically over uh, several decades. The last one, I think, being 85 in Prague. Okay, so again, those are just examples of made orders. A grown order occurs spontaneously. That is, it occurs without the purposive direction or design of uh, a particular mind. So spontaneous orders are present throughout human life. Uh, language is a great example. There is one made order in language, which is Esperanto, which has been around for over 100 years. Last I checked, there were maybe something like 20,000 people on the face of the earth that spoke it. Turns out it's very difficult to acquire. Our, maids, our, our minds are not made to acquire an engineered language. We do really well with natural language. 
and language like English that is, I pity anybody who has to try to learn English as a second language, it's a mess. But it's an order that we learn to use uh, very naturally. Money and currency is uh, an example of an order that, I mean, it's true now that banks or central banks manage that, but the emergence of currency is something that I don't think anybody supposes was planned. The development of the arts, what happens in any of the different arts uh, is an order that emerges. And uh, my friend and colleague, uh, John Hasness, uh, is sort of fierce on the notion of the development of English common law and Anglo-American private law as being a product of um, spontaneous order as well. And I should mention also spontaneous orders occur everywhere in nature. It's not just in the human case, but all biology uh, is effectively a spontaneous order. So what makes an order spontaneous is the absence of a single purpose or goal that accounts for its order and organization. Now, those of you who are familiar with this that have read some Hayek and maybe encountered Hayek uh, through economics um, are uh, going to be well aware of the significance of spontaneous orders uh, for economic planning that is distributed, not central economic uh, planning. Hayek argues that that allows us to take advantage of local knowledge and utilizing scarce resources. I wanna do something different. I wanna focus on the moral benefit of spontaneous social orders as opposed to political uh, societies. And in particular, I wanna say the big payoff there is a congruence with equal authority. So let me tell that story a little bit. Uh, so again, back to Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle thinks that it's characteristic of human beings that we're characteristically end setters and end seekers. We set goals, we devise plans for pursuing them. It's very easy to make a cartoon of that view, uh, oversimplify it. I think it's a subtle and powerful insight into the way that we reason practically about how to live and what to do. Uh, and Aristotle says, this is the distinctively human way of getting around in the world. There's no other animals that do that. They do lots of other things, but they don't set ends and pursue them as we do. Many times these goals are indeterminate. By indeterminate, I just mean they don't have a lot of specific content. We only find out what they are, what those goals are, we're in the, when we're in the pursuit of them. Uh, it's often been said that uh, marriage is one of those. You don't really know what marriage is like or what your marriage will be except by engaging it. I think that's been my experience and the experience, the experience of most people. So is schooling. Actually, I have here an example of writing a dissertation. You don't have any idea when you start a dissertation what that thing's gonna turn out to be. Nonetheless, uh, it emerges as you write it. Nonetheless, that's your goal. Uh, same thing though, you might say for getting a, uh, getting a bac baccalaureate degree or something like that. You don't really know what's involved until you engage in the pursuit of it. So our setting and pursuing goals is an expression of our authority over ourselves. It's a determination of ourselves for ourselves of what we're going to do. Uh, we lay down the law and we follow that law. Now in a maid order, in a taxes, again, this is like the Spartacaiad or the marching band, the, the, the order, the goals that people seek in that order are imposed on them from the top down. Right? The marching band members or the Spartacaiad athletes go where the bosses of those social organizations tell them to. Now, that's not a bad thing. It can be a good thing, uh, as I think is testified to by the enjoyment that both participating in and observing marching bands and presumably uh, Spartacaiads um, uh, produce. I do not know about the degree to which the participants in the Spartacaiads participated voluntarily. I can tell you that is true for uh, marching bands. So there's an order that we get pleasure out. It's enjoyable to produce, it's, an, it's enjoyable to participate. Uh, same thing for orchestras, plays, right? I can extend that, lid, uh, that list uh, ad infinitum. So it often makes sense to join, to, to contribute to made orders for just that shared purpose. Having shared purposes with other people um, can be very satisfying. If you know what is the end that you want to accomplish, um, a, a taxes can be an excellent way to produce it. We don't get iPhones without uh, a taxes, right? Without somebody setting out and uh, coming up with that order and bringing it about. Uh, an iPhone is never going to be the product of a spontaneous order. So it's useful or if there's convergence or agreement on that end, even if that end is somewhat indeterminate. The key thing here is that a taxes has to have a single shared end. That's essential to the idea 
of a tax or made order. But when we choose to contribute to made orders, we're, I shouldn't have said but, I should, should have said therefore, we're submitting ourselves to someone else's authority for that guiding in. You want a Spartacide, you want a marching band, you have to agree to go where the director tells you to go. And that's what you do when you choose to join the Spartacied or the church or the IHS seminar or agree to go to work for Megacorp. When you choose to contribute to a made order, you retain your ultimate authority over yourself. I mentioned last time the importance of understanding, understanding contract as a part, as a crucial part actually, of the exercise of uh, authority and the equal exercise of, of authority. And this is right where it comes in. So your joining is an exercise of the kind of authority that uh, is, uh, that's recognized through our practices of promises and contracts. Things are different when the made order is one that you are compelled to join. When the obligation to be governed or directed by whoever it is that's directing that order is imposed by an authority that isn't reciprocal or equal. Then, in that condition, the top-down establishment of ends and determination of ends reflects an inequality of authority, which is what I was uh, arguing that we should resist. So whoever is at the top can obligate those below by establishing ends or goals, directives, uh, in ways that are not reciprocal. Right? The trombonist has to go where the band director tells him to go. Uh, the band director does not have to go where the trombonist tells him to go. So there's an inequality there. Not a problem if the trombonist chooses to put himself in that position. It is if he doesn't have any choice about it. And that's true whether those at the top are one or many. I think that's true also of democratic majorities. There's nothing about a majority that makes those who are in the majority have uh, any kind of uh, unequal authority. They have exactly the same authority that they do when they're individuals. Here's Adam Smith's uh, take on the sort of problematic nature of what I'm calling political societies as representing or as constituting a particular kind of uh, compulsory made order. Uh, he calls the engineers for these kinds of systems the man, the man of system. He says the man of system seems to imagine that he can arrange the different members of a great society with as much ease as the hand arranges the different pieces upon a chessboard. He does not consider that the pieces upon the chessboard have no other principle of motion besides that which the hand impresses upon them, but that in the great chessboard of human society, every single piece has a principle of motion of its own, altogether different from that which the legislature might choose to impress on it. In other words, we can choose goals other than those that are being imposed on us. So the result is that there's two really, we're confronted with a contrast between two different ways of treating people. The man of system sees other people as chess pieces to be commanded. The other way to go that Smith is encouraging us to recognize is that chess pieces can think and choose for themselves. And that's what we can do. And we can recognize their authority to do so. That was the ideal that I was arguing for in the first session and speaking of rights as a means of recognizing in the last one. Uh, that means refraining from imposing on them our no notions of what they're obligated to do. So in a spontaneous social order, the choice of ends people seek is left up to people themselves. Uh, that's a burden, and some people find them burdensome, but it's a matter of the responsibility of agents that have the capacity to do it, to choose the ends that they are going to, to serve. They're free to exercise their authority to obligate themselves through contract and join made orders if they choose, but not to be compelled. A cosmos, and this is actually uh, Hayek's uh, term for a spontaneous order. It's a place where, other, where people can find others with whom they can share ends and cooperate with them, including choosing ends to be sought with others through made orders. I do not want to suggest that this is the difference between good and bad kinds of, of orders. Both orders can be fine. Uh, made orders that are compulsory are the place that I'm locating the problem and associating that with political societies. Uh, and if not cooperate, at least coordinate so as not to collide and conflict with them. This is a distinction that is somewhat arbitrary. I don't think there's a settled um, agreement on what these means. What I want to contrast here is people cooperating when they share ends and when they seek means to uh, accomplish those ends that they agree upon. And that's a sort of natural source of tax that were made orders. People coordinate when they don't share ends, right? The people in these cars 
uh, in this uh, image here have very uh, pursuing very different ends. They're all trying to get to different places, but they regulate their pursuit of those distinct ends by rules that keep them from colliding so that they can do that in a way without uh, impinging unduly on the end seeking of others. So this I think is uh, something like uh, the idea, the image all the way back uh, for Locke and his conception of our natural condition. Uh, remember that he said, and he characterized this as a state of perfect freedom to order their actions, dispose of their possessions and persons as they f think fit within the bounds of the law of nature without asking leave or depending upon the will of any other man. So the image that we get starting with Locke, which is where I located uh, the foundations of classical liberalism, is a people setting and pursuing their own ends and goals in ways that are coordinated with others doing the same thing. So what does a spontaneous comprehensive social order look like? That is not a political society at the bottom level. It's going to be a civil society constituted by lots and lots of smaller made orders and spontaneous orders. So it's one that's compatible with Spartacides, at least if participation is voluntary, corporations, IHS seminars, churches, you name it. Uh, it's got markets for economic exchange, practitioners of arts. It is political, Aristotle's political animals exercising their sociality in all kinds of ways that they choose rather than being having their in seeking chosen for them through the exercise of authority in the polis. That's the idea that Aristotle couldn't get his mind around. Importantly, and this is kind of the pointy end of the prescriptive stick here uh, for, my, uh, for my lecture here, a civil, civil society is not realized by people asking what kind of society they should create. We don't make a spontaneous order by asking what kind of order we want and then designing it. Uh, and in particular, we don't kind, we don't ask what kind of order we should impose on other people, uh, which is a habit that is all too easy for many, most, or perhaps all human beings uh, to fall into. So this is the wrong question, asking what kind of society we should build, if that's anything other than thinking about rules that allow people to choose the ends that they themselves want to see. If we're imposing ends for their activity, that's an assumption of unequal authority. An authority over others whose reciprocal authority um, cannot be accepted. Instead, it's us pursuing our own ends in ways that avoid collision with other, collisions with others and sometimes involve cooperation with others. That's the idea. So by nature, this model of civil society represents a certain form of human relations. It's one in which no individual is imposing on others his or her conception of how people should interact. That is to say, nobody is exercising unequal and coercive authority over others, not imposing ends on others. So civil society under, under this characterization is a manifestation of equal authority. And I think these different societies, civil versus political, um, produce different kinds of people, different kinds of uh, members. So in a civil society, the kind of civil society that I'm describing, the authority over themselves is in the hands of each individual rather than in the hands of others. I think having that authority, recognizing that you recognize that you have that authority, that both the benefits and burdens of that are on you and that you're responsible for it, uh, makes for different people than those who uh, become accustomed to uh, being under the direction or management of other people. So it's a matter of taking responsibility for yourself rather than expecting others to be responsible for them. It's a matter, importantly, I think, of seeing others in a certain way, seeing them as equally authoritative and responsible, which is, a, uh, I think, a really important form of respect, rather than as seeing, seeing them primarily as competitors for political power, which, as we know, uh, is a very frequent motif um, in uh, contemporary, at least American society, and, uh, and others then as wards of political decision. And this is a, an unsolicited ad that I'm actually working on a book now that's making that story out as the essence of uh, justice as a virtue of character rather than as a virtue of uh, societies. Uh, the irony here, and I started with Aristotle and I'm actually going to uh, wrap up here with Aristotle. We actually do have something like this idea in Aristotle. It's not talked about very much, but I find it actually remarkable. When Aristotle is thinking about the polis, 
um, the form of government that he thinks is the most favorable is one in which the citizens, he says, rule and are ruled in turn. And they have to have the virtues of obedience and the virtues of uh, leadership. And I think that's a remarkably prescient and insightful understanding of the kind of relations between people that I'm thinking of. Now, he situates that in the polis, uh, in which very few people are citizens. They're slaves. There's women who aren't, don't even come close to being recognized as having that kind of authority. So there's lots and lots of other problems with Aristotle. I'm not suggesting he's moving in a classical liberal direction. But I'm an Aristotelian, uh, and uh, sort of generally, and I find it quite interesting that he thinks among citizens that's the right model. It's a model of equal authority. Not his, as I say, and he ties it to the polis, which I think is no longer, is certainly not a viable social model. And I would say more generally, I'm skeptical that the state is uh, a viable political model or viable model for the, these kinds of relations of authority. But nonetheless, I think Aristotle gets the moral point, and he also gets the point about the kind of people uh, that this creates. So I think we should be aware of the moral costs of accepting or endorsing political forms of association as opposed to civil ones. Those costs necessarily involve accepting a fundamental inequality of authority, of seeing some as entitled to authority that others lack. Uh, if the abstractness of that point escapes you, think about last week's Supreme Court decisions. Think about the authority for the direction of other people's lives that nine Americans uh, got to exercise where the rest of us have nothing like any kind of reciprocal um, capacity to shape their lives. So there, we have deep inequality of authority um, in our political system. To what extent can we hope to supplant political societies with civil society? This uh, question came up last time and I'm gonna reiterate uh, what I said then. It probably would not be a good idea even if we could. Um, part, a big part of the reason is a civil society like I've described is going to work only with people who are comfortable in the skins of uh, being their own bosses, of being authorities in company with others with equal authority and taking responsibility for that. Uh, we're not, uh, most of us equipped for that right now. And without that, we would have big problems. What I do wanna claim is number one, don't confuse these forms of social organization. They are strikingly different, both in sort of their formal social structural uh, layouts, but also in terms of their moral dimensions and in terms of their implications for the kinds of people that they form. Um, so one way to affect change amongst people, one that you hear about all the time, if you are a student in, in school, you're going to hear about this all the time, opportunities to become politically active uh, and uh, try to work to get the instruments of political power. Um, another is the instruments of civility and community, and I'm recommending the second and not the first. Um, this is a matter of the association, the practices, the institutions that you can join or form in any of innumerable ways. You can affect people's lives in response to the values and norms that are important to you in ways that you cannot when it's being imposed by a uh, majority diktat. And in the meantime, you can become, work on becoming and living out a life as a civil human being, which is a really, really good thing. And I will stop there. Thank you. So we've got several questions here. The first is, how does what you've talked about here dovetail with how we should think about justice? How we should think about justice? So um, yeah, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a nice uh, straight line, given that I gave this little pitch for this uh, book that I'm working on. Um, I'm a skeptic about the utility of thinking about uh, justice as a property of societies. Let me rephrase that. There's two different ways of thinking about justice as a property of societies. One is to think that a just society is one that has certain structural properties. Uh, so if you're an egalitarian, suppose you think that um, social justice consists in equality of wealth or income. Uh, you might think that a just society then is one in which there's a structure of equal wealth or, or income or what have you. I think that's a mistake. The second way to go about it is to think that a just society is a society that's comprised by and large of just people. And that's the way in which I think about justice as being a property of society. The property that societies have in virtue of the sort of moral nature of those uh, who are in them uh, 
when it comes to thinking about justice as a matter of uh, individuals, again, I have a largely Aristotelian story of virtue. Um, and uh, in this book that I'm working on, I'm developing the, so Aristotle has a notion of justice as a virtue, which is quite an important uh, a virtue in his account. I agree with its importance. I think Aristotle's account of the virtue itself is wrongheaded in really seriously uh, important ways. So I wanna dump Aristotle's account and say something like the ideals that I've been defending in these last uh, three lectures are characteristic of that virtue. It's a matter of recognizing and responding to the recognition that other people have this kind of authority, that they are capable of obligating us, of uh, engaging with us in relations of obligation and accountability and so on. That's where I wanna locate um, justice as a virtue. I wish I had, if I had my book published, I could hold it up now and you know, get some free advertising. It's not even written yet, so don't try to buy it. Should we think about spontaneous orders that are unjust? Spontaneous orders absolutely can be unjust. Um, the I think the diagnostic tool for identifying spontaneous orders that are unjust um, are not by looking at a model of social justice and saying, hmm, are these, is this structure, is there a problem with structural injustice here? I think spontaneous orders are that are unjust are orders that emerge in which people treat each other unjustly. Um, so it's not clear to me that um, slavery could work except as a made order. I think it's really clear that uh, historically the relations between men and women uh, have, that have emerged have been had a great deal of spontaneity to them and, and were fundamentally unjust. So um, the subordination of women is, is a deep, it's completely incompatible with the uh, inequality of authority. So I think the way to, number one, the way to recognize them is by, I mean, I wanna say the, diag the right diagnostic tool is equality of authority and where we have spontaneous orders in which uh, the structure is built around or encouraging people not to see each other as equally authoritative, now you've got an unjust order. What should we do about them? Uh, I don't have a one size fits all answer to that other than find ways to change them, resist them, don't accept them. Uh, certainly don't encourage or uh, maintain them to the extent that you, you can do that. I think we have uh, an obligation to resist them as we do uh, a general obligation to resist injustice. Does your conception of a spontaneously emerging civil society require a commitment to pluralism? Uh, a commitment to purposes? Sorry, was that? To liberalism. Oh, um, pluralism. To pluralism, um, depending on what pluralism means, I would say probably so. So in the kind of civil society, uh, here's an example of the way in which I think that answer is, is certainly yes. So in the civil society that I have in mind that I'm kind of arguing for here, it's entirely compatible uh, and plausible and may for some people be attractive to enter a, uh, a very communistic sort of made order. So um, if you think about, uh, right, sort of the model of uh, the kibbutzim um, that are still around in Israel, they're, I think, no longer uh, as uh, popular a form of social organization as they were. There is absolutely nothing uh, that prohibits one from joining a kibbutz uh, with other people who are uh, similarly minded and, uh, and governing and, and agreeing to be governed in this community by effectively uh, a to to, uh, excuse me a totalitarian system of authority, um, so it's pluralist in the sense that I think the rest of us have to respect people's choices to do those sorts of things, provided they're not imposing those choices on others. Uh, that's the kind of life we choose. We might uh, think you know it'd be really good to to have a heart to heart with people who think that's a good way to live their lives, but nonetheless they're authoritative over the, their lives, and we don't get to tell them they must do otherwise. Uh, and those of us who don't find that form of life attractive can do lots and lots of different things. If you really want to walk around in a heavy, sweaty band uniform on a af sunny afternoon in the middle of September, uh, you know, more power to you. Uh, I don't have any interest, never have uh, myself in being in a marching band, but those who find that satisfying, yeah, go for it. So I think there's all different forms of life that people find satisfying. And I think as long as they are doing so, in ways that are respectful of other people's boundaries and other people's authority, 
then I think, yes. So that form of pluralism, uh, and, and I think that's actually a pretty capacious uh, notion of pluralism, at least with respect to saying, yeah, it means we can tolerate communities of people who are really intolerant of people exercising their own authority as long as they've opted in. What about harder cases where there are illiberal communities in civil societies within the larger liberal society? So, so a, a community or a, a small group that wants to, uh, you know, exert illiberal, perhaps even unjust practices on yeah. individuals within that community. How should we think about that? Uh, there, uh, there's two questions there, I think, an easier one and a harder one. So if the two easy ones and a really hard one. So one easy, one medium, one really hard. The easy one is this. If they want to exert that pressure on people who haven't chosen their way in, there's a big problem. They're acting unjustly, and that's sort of a, a simple answer. The, the medium one is that I want to say if people are uh, choosing their way in with a pretty robust notion of uh, voluntary choice there, that is, they're choosing as competent adults and they're fully informed as to what they're choosing, I think we have to accept those choices as expressions of their authority over themselves. So I think they're due a considerable amount of respect and deference. The place where the question is really hard is with like second, uh, second generation members of those societies. Suppose you have a, a very totalitarian uh, or um, despotic, despotically governed society where people have opted in and now they produce children. Um, are those children um, subject to uh, that kind of authority? And I think that's probably not right. There needs to be provision for a right of exit. Now, this is a question that Robert Nozick uh, wrestles with in Anarchy State and Utopia. And I think there's some really hard issues here uh, with both, both the medium and the hard question. Uh, one is, if, you know, if the people in the community say, uh, sorry, these are our kids, you know, keep out. Uh, what do we do? It is, if the option here is, uh, is relieving their uh, being subject to despotism, if the answer is force, are we justified in doing that? I don't have a simple question or a simple answer to that question. Um, uh, but there's also blurry lines. Were people really fully aware of what they were entering into when they did it, when they made their choice? Were they choosing it in sort of uh, some kind of blind and not very mature idealism when they really didn't know what the hell they were doing with their lives? Uh, are those choices ones that we need to respect? So I, I don't think there are simple answers here. I think those are things probably, uh, first of all, I'm pretty sure that if we try to work them out in the abstract, they're going to end up being useless. Uh, my thinking would be um, where there are concrete cases where that needs to be dealt with. We start with a commitment to respecting equality of authority and try to work out what that means in particular circumstances. But that may, might be very challenging to do um, in, in many cases possible. How can we chip away the widespread notion that the solution to every problem is to pass more laws? Boy, if I had the answer to that one, uh, I might be doing something different than sitting here talking to you. I mean, my way of chipping away at it is I'm sitting here talking to you. Um, you know, I, I certainly am suspicious of any um, top down answer to that where somebody says, you know, I've got the magic bullet. Here's a magic bullet we know is a problem. If only we can get this law, law passed, we can undermine this tendency, right? That's not going to work. And uh, I think in general forms of, uh, ways of exercising the tools of political power for obvious reasons uh, are a bad way to go. Uh, so I think it's a problem that has to be worked away at, on the margins. And it's each of us thinking about uh, what we can do by way of engaging other people as uh, responsible and authoritative beings um, and by sort of making explicit with them but that's what's going on. That look, here's something that you and I are doing um, that's not working through the machinery of political power. Um, here's something that we can do, maybe not just the two of us, but others. We can do things, but we can talk about ideas, we can exchange it, we can do whatever 
uh, we can interact with other people peacefully in such a way as to offer alternative forms of association that encourage us to think about ourselves in these ways. Um, you know, whether that mean it probably doesn't mean signing up for yet one more political club on campus to campaign for laws getting passed of a certain character. I mean, I'm pretty skeptical that that will go anywhere except for more of what we now have. Um, so, yeah, I think that really has to be a bottom up um, sort of solution working at, at the margin, as economists say. Um, thinking about what I give for each person, sort of thinking about what he or she can do in his or her conditions with those people that she knows, uh, have relationships where those ideas can be expressed and encouraged. Um, I think more than that's probably going to be tough to come up with uh, any kind of recipe. It seems like there are inequities in the ability of the very rich and the very poor to engage in civil society. Does this suggest that we have a duty to make sure that the poorest have the means to engage in some sort of equitable way? Uh, good question. So uh, if you recall, so I mean, I actually uh, intended to answer sort of that very question um, in the course of uh, my talks on egalitarianism. Uh, I think um, poverty and destitution is incapacitating in lots of ways. In, in, you know, some ways, maybe, if, if you talk to democratic egalitarians, they're worried about participation in the political process. I'm not. I'm not, because I think the political process has, has deep more problems. But they are challenged just in meeting their own needs, let alone, for example, being able to walk away from proffered contracts. We talked about this a little bit just a few minutes ago with the idea of a despotic community. I think it's OK. Uh, for that such a community to live and, you know, and live for people to live as they want to, provided that those who are in there are in there because they chose to do that. Well, if they're in there because they chose to do that, because the alternative was standing outside and freezing in a snowstorm, uh, that's not the right kind of choice. And very often when people have really, really bad choice sets, um, we're reluctant to ascribe to them full voluntary consent to the contract or agreement or whatever it is that they are entering into. This is true also for employment agreements. Um, so I think thus, gen so there's two answers then to uh, what's to be done there. I think for the very rich, the solution there is get rid of the political process in which uh, uh, great monetary power can do the kinds of damage that we know that it can. The problem is in the political process, not the wealth, I would say. At the other end, on the one hand, first, as I said, I, I'm a believer that we do have, we as individuals, as individuals who are capable of recognizing the needs of other people, do have obligations, do have, sorry, I should say, in light of my earlier language, do have duties to help them. So I think we do have duties of charity and beneficence to help out those who are in really indigent circumstances. But the second thing is to recognize that insofar as we're worried about or choice sets that are occasioned by poverty and destitution, as they are, the absolute best sort of broad measure of giving people more choice sets is to increase their wealth. And we know that the engine for increasing wealth is exchange um, under systems of uh, respect for property and contract and, um, and law and so forth, it's markets. So I think, yeah, what we do is um, do the best that we can to facilitate the operation of the greatest engine that humankind has ever known for alleviating poverty and destitution, and that's markets. How free are the decisions we make if they are constantly affected by our cultures and societies? Sorry, how, what are they? How, what's how free are the decisions we how make if they are constantly affected by our cultures and societies? Yeah, that's good. Um, there is uh, a deep question about whether or not we're capable of uh, being free to do anything, uh, as opposed to just being uh, pushed in maybe more subtle ways by the same kind of causal order that's at work. Uh, you know, when my dog really wants to go outside, it may look like he's choosing to do that instead of peeing in the house. Not really. Uh, that's the way he was wired, and that's what dog, you know, a, at least a dog with a sufficient degree of intelligence can do. Maybe we're just doing that on a really grand scale. 
Um, I think that conception of ourselves uh, is really difficult to sustain. We find it very difficult to resist the idea that um, we are entitled to hold each other responsible for the choices that we make, even when uh, we think that there's a whole lot of pressure, environmental or uh, cultural or what have you, um, on us to make the decisions that we do. And sometimes those lines are hard to draw, hard to defend, but I think our, our inclination to see ourselves and those that we're with that way is in practice, is in practice irresistible. Uh, I don't know how to reconcile that idea, the way that we see each, ourselves and each other in that way, with what we know about the causal order. And I'm the latest in a long line of people, philosophers, who have uh, not felt that they could understand uh, how to fit those two pictures together. Immanuel Kant famously was not, and he was a lot smarter than I am, so I don't feel too ashamed about that. Uh, the way that I want to go with that is to actually start with our practices with each other. Start with the fact that we can and do hold each other accountable and responsible for the choices that we make, even in the pres presence of uh, social pressure. Maybe there are some conditions under which we'll treat social pressure as being, you know, sort of uh, a, a kind of force that really no human being could prevail against. Um, that might be right. Maybe there are conditions under which we could do that. And that's the right thing to do. But I think those are extreme conditions. We're not tempted to do that in our day-to-day -day decision making, and I think for good reason. So I don't have a good metaphysical story as to how that's possible, but I think we do that with each other and we should take that seriously. And I'm not really too sure that we have an option, uh, except maybe in the boundary cases of doing very much that's, uh, that's different. Relatedly, and I think this is the last question that we have time for. As liberals, at what point do we consider that someone is mature, knowledgeable, and liberated enough to make a free decision? Uh, that raises a question that's really hard for liberals. Um, and this is liberals of all stripes, classical or welfare liberals or what have you, which is thinking about children thinking about the rights of children, thinking about authority over children, thinking about the responsibility for children. And one thing that makes that so thorny is, and I take it this is where this question is coming from, the boundary line between children and adults, while it's really clear at either extreme, right? It's, there's no question that two-year-olds are not adults. There's no question that uh, most people of my age are functioning adults, although we can withdraw that judgment in various cases. There's boundary cases that are really hard right in the middle. Uh, and there's very mature 13-year-olds, there's 22-year-olds that shouldn't be out after dark uh, without somebody looking after them. Uh, in some cases in the law, the law just has to draw an arbitrary line and say, you know, when you hit your 16th birthday, you can do such and such, or your 18th birthday, or your 21st birthday. I think um, there's not much need for that except for the explicit provisions of law. And part of what we do, I mean, I had this experience with my kids as they were growing up, you know, they're, they're both adults. Uh, but it became evident to me that that kind of capacity to exercise adult judgment and adult authority over themselves came incrementally over time. There were some decisions that they were capable of making for themselves pretty capably and that I felt like I, you know, I, I need not to argue with this decision pretty early on and others that came uh, much later. And I think probably in most of the cases in which we need to make those judgments, that's what we, we can do and we have to do is case by case, particular judgments of individuals. And maybe, you know, while I'm engaging with my kids in one way, people might, other people might have been engaging them in others and saying, you're too young, or sure, you can go ahead and do that. Um, so they live in a world in the, this sort of uh, gray area world where they're being treated in different ways too, maybe being, trusting, being entrusted with more authority in some cases, less others. I think given the fuzzy nature of the boundaries, Aristotelians are really comfortable with fuzzy boundaries. Uh, that's probably the right way to do it. We don't get that in law. We do get that in civil society, which would be another one of its great merits, I think.